Okay, we're ready to get started. It's two o'clock. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am Orby Dingwall and I'm one of your MyNet librarians. And today we're talking about levels of evidence uh, in your healthcare practice. Uh, normally we have two of us to present, uh, but Christine Nielsen unfortunately is, um, is homesick today. And our other sort of backup librarian that uh, normally I would have pulled in at the last minute, uh, she is on vacation today. So you are stuck with me and I know that that's not as good as having um, two people to kind of back each other up, but uh, it should still be a great session. So, we have four objectives for today's session. We're gonna make sure you know about MyNet's services. We're gonna talk about the evidence pyramid, and we'll go through examples of different forms and levels of evidence. And then we're going to make sure all of that ties into how you are using evidence in your work or the different kinds of clinical decisions that you can be uh, being informed uh, from the evidence about. So uh, before we go any further, let's just make sure that everyone is a little bit familiar and a little bit comfortable with our online software, which is GoToWebinar. So if um, you've lost your GoToWebinar menu, at the bottom of your screen, you should see uh, the little kind of flower icon. So you can click on that if ever you need your menu to come back up. Otherwise, you can use your menu box. Um, sometimes you might only just see like the little tiny floating um, sideways orange arrow. Uh, you might need to click on that to display the full menu. And then you can click on the questions, uh, the down arrow, and then you can, if you have any questions for me as we're going along, like if there's any problems, or if you just have any questions, or uh, especially if you'd like to contribute or make a, um, uh, give some, a comment or a suggestion or give an example about a way that you're using evidence, please, by all means, do that. So the refresher on that, look for that, uh, use your menu box to look at questions. If you need to get your menu box, you click on that blue flower or, and or the um, sideways orange arrow. So we're going to launch a poll and to make sure that you, uh, one, can do the polls, um, and two, ooh, this is a little, okay, I think it's okay here. It's just taking a little bit longer to launch our poll than normal. And of course, this would be the way that we start our, um, Okay, that did not seem to work. I'm just gonna give that a, oh, there we go. Okay, so you can just fill in here. Okay, almost everyone has voted. We'll give you a couple more seconds. Great, okay, so most everyone was able to successfully locate their um, question box and um, and a couple of not sure's. Um, so uh, that's just if you have a question or need to um, give some feedback. Okay, and I'm going to make sure that, there we go, you can see the slides. Thank you for your patience, there we go. So. What is MyNet? Uh, MyNet is, is an acronym that stands for Manitoba's Health Information and Knowledge Network, and it's basically library services to staff of the participating regional health authorities, staff at Manitoba Health, um, seniors in active living, and all fee-for-service physicians in the province of Manitoba. We've got a, a small but mighty team um, here. So there's uh, two your two main librarians, myself, who's the liaison to the RHAs, Christine Nielsen, who's the liaison to Manitoba Health. We have our backup librarian, Gail, and our library um, technician, Cheryl. So that's our team. And we have four core services, which are, if you ever need some information, anything from like, I just want a few articles to tell me about this, to, oh my gosh, I need everything to know there is about that. 
uh, we will do that literature search for you and then send you a list of references and abstracts. From that list, then you can, um, if you'd like to read any of the full text articles, we uh, then you just request them through us. And similarly, that's what we call document delivery. Similarly, if you've been doing your own searching, so whether you search in PubMed or Google Scholar, or you heard from a friend about a really great article, um, even if you're just searching on Google and you came across that paywall that says, oh, to read this article, just pay us $85. Don't ever pay that. Um, just send us the citation information and say, hey, I'd like the full text of this, and then we'll send it to you. We also do a current awareness. So if you uh, work in an area and you've got um, some favorite topics, some favorite authors, some favorite journals, we can set up a weekly alert so that you get all of the new information that's published on those. And we also do training, education, and orientation sessions. So we do our webinars. And if ever you've got a group of individuals and you're looking to either have some training on MyNet or some training on how to use information, we're happy to set up a custom session, we're happy to come in person, we're happy to do the webinar. And also, um, you can access UpToDate. So many of you at your um, uh, RHA or Manitoba Health facilities can access it directly. And if you're ever off-site, you can use your library card to come in um, through the University of Manitoba to access UpToDate that way. So those are all of our MyNet services. And now we can talk about evidence. So uh, we called the session today evidence-based practice. And for those of you that have been around for a little while, you'll know that um, it started as evidence-based and now we tend to use the um, terminology of evidence-informed uh, practice, which is a little bit different. And it's a three-legged approach. So you always start with the best available research evidence and you also then have to bring in some expertise and then also very importantly is the element of the client uh, preferences and values. And sometimes those three things are all the same and sometimes um, two are the same and one is different, Or, but they're always the kinds of things that we're thinking about as we're looking um, at having an evidence informed practice. So we can just kind of think through that model as we're going through all of the examples and then we'll come um, to some specific examples at the end of the session using those. We've got another little graphic here, and this is kind of how we, the evidence-based or evidence-informed practice cycle. So often we'll start with a patient or a dilemma um, or a situation, and we'll kind of ask some questions about it, right? What, uh, what are the sort of common treatments for this patient? Or what is a common approach to this, um, to this situation? Or what are other places doing about this? And then we acquire evidence. So we can acquire evidence from the published evidence. We can talk to some experts. Uh, then we're going to appraise all of that and see what is the quality of this evidence? How, um, is it going to be directly transferable to my needs? Is it relatable to my situation? And then we're going to apply the relevant parts. Uh, and then we're going to act. We're going to see how everything goes. And then we might need to do that all over again, depending on how things went. So it's um, always an ongoing cycle. Uh, about, and the whole premise is sort of that uh, we should always be sort of um, keeping evidence in our practice and making evidence informed decisions all along the way. So if we were if you were here in person, I would ask hands up who has heard of the evidence pyramid. And if you have any experience with it, um, I'd love to see your um, your uh, sort of comments in the questions box. You don't have to just ask questions. You can make comments. Um, and so the evidence pyramid uh, is um, sort of an easy way to remember sort of the highest levels of evidence and the lowest level of evidence. And the idea is that the higher up the evidence pyramid you go, the more reliable and uh, the less biased the evidence will be. So um, expert opinion is at the bottom because experts can be very biased and systematic reviews are at the top because uh, there's a lot of controls in the systematic review methodology um, to control for bias. So uh, it's good to kind of have a, a sense always of what's the best level of evidence and what's the lowest level and everything in between. And so that's what we're kind of going to work through. Now, the evidence pyramid is divided into three. 
The top half is the filtered, uh, filtered information. The middle part is the unfiltered, sort of kind of like raw information. And then the bottom part is the background information or the expert opinion. And so the idea here is, is that uh, the middle section is sort of like individual studies. And then the top section is if when you take a whole bunch of those individual studies and you m mash them all together and analyze the data all in one big study, then that's um, a less bias uh, and more reliable um, sample of information. So it gets rolled to the top. So some caveats. The appraisal step is really essential. And if you've been to our sessions before, as I know many of you have, um, you know that we're always talking about critical appraisal, critical appraisal, critical appraisal, appraise, 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 appraise. Uh, and that applies here especially. Um, and so you might have, uh, let's say you have a patient who has um, three different conditions and you're wondering how to treat one, especially when a lot of the treatments are then um, counterindicated uh, for the other two conditions, uh, all of the available evidence uh, might not be relevant then to you. Uh, so you might need to talk to an expert that says, okay, when you've got a patient with um, condition A, then you would normally do these things, but if they have also condition B and or condition C, then here are the things that we're, um, that we're recommending that you do. And so sometimes that's the case. Also sometimes, um, you know, a, a case controlled study or a randomized controlled trial might be, um, might have far higher methodological rigor than uh, a systematic review. So a really, really, really great, one really, really, really great randomized controlled trial might be better than um, one very poorly done systematic review. So always be appraising as you're going, both for quality of, of, of evidence, for bias that's introduced, um, and for applicability to your patient or your situation. And also, and we're gonna talk about this some more, but different research methods are useful for different types of research questions. So randomized control trials are not always appropriate or not always ethical. And just like systematic reviews, um, if there's not a lot of evidence on something, it would not make any sense to be doing a systematic review because there's nothing to actually review. Uh, and also the answer can change over time. And that's something that we all know, right? We've got very different practices today that we do for things. Um, sometimes we've learned them the very, very, very hard way. Uh, and as we get more information or have more um, more patients with certain, uh, as there's new drugs, as there's new treatments, as we have better data on patients, um, then the answers change. So we, all things that we wanna keep in mind. So what is a systematic review? Uh, a systematic review attempts to synthesize all empirical evidence that fits into a pre-specified criteria in order to answer a specific question. So um, they're very, very, very specific. And basically what happens is um, a team of researchers say, okay, we're interested in condition A and we're in this kind of patients and with these kinds of outcomes, we wanna know what the evidence says about this. And so then librarians do a really, really um, thorough uh, uh, search of the literature. And then researchers screen through all of those results uh, when they've got and they've identified all of the research that fits that specific criteria, then often um, biostatisticians will then come in and run a meta-analysis and say, okay, here is your answer. Um, sometimes the data isn't, isn't, um, uh, isn't clean enough to do a meta-analysis, and then there's all other kinds of ways that you can pull out that data and say, okay, which, you know, what treatment should we be doing? Should it be this one or that one? Or what, what really is the evidence saying um, about these outcomes or about this clinical intervention? So it's basically, you take a whole bunch of evidence um, that's already been done and you roll it all together to then get your answer. Uh, and the methods are very, very, very systematic, hence why it's called the systematic review. And the whole premise is to be evidence-based each step of the way and to minimize bias. Um, 
So the characters of the characteristics of the systematic review are very first you set your objectives and your criteria and then you uh, I talked about all of these. Um, there's also a whole level um, about assessing for the validity of the studies. So often what will happen is uh, like I said, the librarians do the literature search, the researchers then screen through and say, OK, these are relevant to our topic. These aren't. And then they'll come down to kind of a manageable, well, hopefully a manageable um, number of references. And they'll say, OK, let's really dive in. Now, what happens sometimes is, is that what's indicated in, um, in a study's title and abstract isn't always exactly what they did. Uh, and so you have to kind of really dig through. And then sometimes the, um, the quality of, that, um, of those studies also isn't very, um, it's not, they're not valid or it's not reliable. So sometimes you can only get so much out of um, each individual study. So that takes a lot of work is to go through and kind of pull out the pieces that, um, that are okay to pull out. And then there's a systematic presentation and synthesis of the findings. And so here, this is the uh, flowchart, and it's a common uh, flowchart that's used in systematic reviews. And so at the top, it just says that the, you know they started in this review, they started with um, almost 6,000 records, and then um, they screened the titles and the abstracts. And um, after they removed the duplicates, there was about 4,000. And then they screened and screened, and then they came to 155 that they screened the full text of. And it just takes you through every step of the way. So you can see this is quite systematic. Um, and that's how each stage of a systematic review is. is it's very, very systematic. All of the methods are very, very clear as to what they did, um, as to what they did. Now, there are many other kinds of reviews. Uh, and so systematic review is a very, very specific thing, um, but there's also rapid review. So this is like, okay, we don't have time to screen 6,000 records. We'll, uh, there's different, um, different places around the world that are working on how can we take all of this information and synthesize it more rapidly. There's also a scoping review, which is just like, we're not really sure about how much evidence is out there or what kind of evidence is out there. And so that really takes a broader, um, a broader look at things. It's not so specific as this kind of patient, this intervention, these outcomes. It's more broad than that. Uh, and then there's just a literature review, which is the kind of things that we do at MyNet all the time, which is just like, I'd like some information or I'd like all the information. Uh, and there's many other kinds. And if you're interested, we've got this citation here, and I will be sending you a copy of the slides at the end of today's session. Okay, I'm going to launch our second poll. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what sorts of research is most appropriate to use systematic review methodology? Okay, so I know the answers are uh, are a little bit longer than normal. Okay, we'll give you a couple more seconds. And it's no pressure. We're not testing. Uh, uh, you don't get a, a pass fail. Okay, so almost everyone has voted. All right, and while you've got the results there, um, so what sorts of research is most appropriate to use systematic review methodology? Um, the most correct answer is A and C, so large amount of evidence with conflicting recommendations, and C, when you can specifically define outcomes and objectives. So the one that's not the most relevant is when you want to get a sense of what research is available, that would be more um, a scoping review or just a general literature review and not a systematic review. So again, a systematic review is really about um, specific patient or population, an intervention, a comparison, and then an outcome. So just when you want to get that sense, um, that is more about um, a scoping or a, or a literature review. 
and I'm just going to make sure that you can. Okay. So where can you find reviews? If you want to find them yourself, you can go to um, the Cochrane Library. And so the Cochrane Library is, uh, Cochrane Reviews are known as the, as the preeminent systematic reviews, largely because they have the most robust methodology. Um, and, and Cochrane is really, really um, a stickler for details and methods. And you can search the Cochrane Library for free, and the abstracts and the plain language summaries are free. But to access the full reviews, um, then you can contact MyNet and we'll send them to you. And what I find with Cochrane Reviews is that uh, if what you're looking for is in Cochrane, it's going to be awesome. But often um, they can be so specific that they're sometimes not, not the greatest, uh, not the, the, sometimes they just don't answer your question. Then the Campbell collaboration is, um, is also a very high quality level of uh, systematic reviews. And then also you can search in databases like Medline or PubMed. Um, you can just limit to systematic reviews. Uh, and also MyNet is always happy to, um, to do the search for you. So I'm gonna show you just really quickly uh, the Cochrane website. So it's CochraneLibrary.com, and I'll just zoom in here so that this is a little bit more clear. And they've just updated their site, but um, it's kind of, I hope it's in a, <laughs> in, a, in a versioning phase because it's still kind of clunky. So all you have to do, CochraneLibrary.com, up here in the search box, you can just type in whatever you're looking for. It might be as broad as diabetes. Probably you could be more um, specific about something. Um, I mean, diabetes is such a huge topic. Uh, as you can see, there's 396 Cochrane reviews on it. You might be interested in all of those. Um, and you can see uh, across the top, I'm not sure how legible it is for you, but there's different kinds of things that are in the Cochrane Library. So there's Cochrane Reviews, there's protocols. So these are uh, when researchers or when research teams have come together and they've said, okay, we are going to do a systematic review on this topic, and they register it with Cochrane. And this serves two purposes. The first is so that if there's other people that are interested in doing that topic, then we're not duplicating all this research. The other is so that is to um, eliminate bias or to reduce bias. Because sometimes what happens is researchers start on a, out on a topic and then they get into the literature and then say like, oh gosh, there are tens of thousands results of results on this topic. That's too many for me. Let's change what we're doing. And that's sort of the opposite of how a systematic review should be. You really should be setting your criteria really up front. So you register your protocol and you say, here's what we're going to do. And then you do it. And so um, the art of doing that uh, in advance and setting that criteria in advance then helps to reduce bias because if you've been changing your outcome criteria or changing any kind of your criteria, uh, that could be introducing bias. Cochrane also, um, then the next tab here, uh, Cochrane also links to trials that are ongoing, similar kind of thing. Um, it's just helpful to know what is currently going on. There's editorials, special collections, and clinical answers. So again, you can search this for free, but to access the full text, then you need to um, contact MyNet, and we'll get you uh, the full text for that. Okay, back to our slides. Great. So um, if anyone is considering doing a systematic review, uh, we always warn people that it takes a significant amount of time. We've seen a real explosion in systematic reviews. Um, you know, I know uh, in, you know, 15 years ago, if you search for systematic reviews um, in Title Abstract and PubMed, you were getting like maybe 100-ish results, and now there's tens of thousands. And partly that's because there's legitimate systematic reviews that have been published. But sometimes the case has been that people have said like, oh gosh, systematic review is at the top of the evidence pyramid. I'm gonna do one of those and that's gonna look so great on my CV. 
Um, that's not a good reason to do a systematic review. Other people have looked at it and said, gosh, I don't need ethics. I don't really need funding or I don't need that much funding. I just need to like go through some literature. This is no big deal. Um, these are all incorrect assumptions, uh, except ethics. You don't need ethics to do a systematic review. Uh, so we've seen an explosion. Um, sometimes there's it's produced some really great results and sometimes not. So we always caution people, systematic reviews always take about five times as long as you think they're going to. And to make sure that you're doing a systematic review because it's the most appropriate methodology, not just because you want to do a systematic review. And systematic reviews do need some money. Um, there's some really, you know, often you're dealing with thousands of references, which can be a nightmare to do in something like Excel. You can do it. Uh, but there's some really great software out there. Um, you know, in the scheme of how much research costs to do, it's not hugely expensive, but you know, for someone um, without a research budget, that is a that can be a barrier. And sometimes you'll need to hire um, a specialist like a librarian or a biostatistician or maybe a, a content expert as well. And finally, you want to make sure if you are doing that systematic review that you know your topics. You don't want to find find out three months into your screening that there's actually thousands of randomized control trials or hundreds of systematic reviews already on your topic. So to learn more about methods, if you're interested in doing one um, or you're just interested in learning more, the Cochrane Handbook, like I said, the Cochrane Library is, um, is the sort of preeminent uh, leader in systematic reviews and their handbook is free to access from the internet. Joanna Briggs Institute tends to, um, it's more of a qualitative focus. They also um, have some really great resources on their website. And then here at the University of Manitoba, there's the George and Fei Yi Center for Healthcare Innovation, and there's a knowledge synthesis unit there. And they offer workshops on elements of systematic reviews. They offer a graduate level course um, that's cross appointed with community health sciences and nursing. It's a really intensive course, but if you want to learn how to do a systematic review, this is the place where it will teach you. Um, and then the Center for Healthcare Innovation, they also, if you're interested in commissioning a systematic review, they also do that as well. So moving um, slightly along from systematic reviews, but staying in that evidence pyramid in the um, filtered information, uh, there's Cadeth. And if you joined us last month uh, when Jill Sutherland um, was uh, gracious enough to join us, she uh, is a Cadeth and she told us all about the uh, services that they offer and the kinds of resources that they have. If you missed that session and are interested, the webinar is available on our MyNet website. And uh, so there's some great services that Cadeth does, and they make all of their um, uh, all of their reviews are available free on their website. And uh, so you can see if they've done a rapid review or a health technology assessment, searching their website is a really great resource and they really um, have high, high levels of evidence are really pushing the bar on how do you do a rapid review and um, what, are the, um, what are the best methods for doing a health technology assessment. So the stuff on their website is really fantastic to check out. And a health technology assessment, it's sort of like a systematic review. Its methods are just as robust but it's really focusing on, um, on the technology assessment. Uh, so it does do some drugs, but it's uh, more about like medical devices and that kind of thing. Where systematic reviews um, can be more general and sometimes they could be about uh, therapy or um, something that's less technical or less device or less drug. Okay, coming down the evidence pyramid, we're coming into clinical practice guidelines. So these are statements that include recommendations that are intended to optimize patient care, and they're informed by evidence. Now, one big difference between the review, the health technology assessments and uh, clinical practice guidelines is about cost. So Cadeth is really invested. Cadeth is, is here in Canada, the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health, and they are really um, vested in looking at, okay, is this device as good or better than that device? And also, um, what is the recommendation for applying it into practice? So device A might be really, um, you know, might be a lot better than device B, 
But if device A is 20,000 times the price, uh, then you might need to look at, well, is it worth it to pay all that much, you know, how much better is it? And when you take the cost into comparison, um, then they're looking at more, the whole picture. Whereas clinical practice guidelines, um, they do tend to focus specifically on the clinical elements and not always on the cost elements. Okay, our third poll, let's get it going here. Oops. Okay. So this poll asks, why are guidelines lower than systematic reviews on the evidence pyramid? So I'll let you take a look through those. Okay, almost everyone has voted. This is great. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Okay, and everyone seems to be split between systematic review methodology is more rigorous and reliable. That is the most correct answer. Um, it was also correct to say guidelines utilize many kinds of evidence, including experts. Um, and so they're a little bit the same, um, but yes, system, so I'm just gonna close that and make sure, great. Yeah, so clinical practice guidelines, they are looking at all of the inputs that they have available and systematic reviews are focused on the best or they're focused on, um, on the uh, really, they would, well, they sometimes include expert opinion. Um, clinical practice guidelines are a little bit more inclusive of all kinds of evidence and systematic reviews are, are really much more robust in what they're looking for. So that's why they're higher on the evidence pyramid. Um, again, reiterating though, that just because a type of research is higher on the evidence pyramid doesn't mean that that specific individual piece of evidence is better than one other specific kind. So the evidence pyramid is meant to be a guide. Okay, moving along here. So some very smart people attending the webinar today. Great job on answering these poll questions. Now, if you're looking for uh, practice guidelines, there are some great places that you can search. Um, they keep changing the name on this one. Uh, it's now uh, the CPG Infobase, which is Clinical Practice Guidelines Infobase, published by the Canadian Medical Association. Um, if you forget what it's called, you can like Google CMA uh, guidelines um, and they they now are calling it Jewel CMA. Um, but it's a great little place where you can go and search for guidelines. And it's the current Canadian guidelines, um, primarily medical. They don't always incorporate all the nursing or, and allied health ones, but it's a good place to start. And they are available in English and in French. And I will take us, oh, I didn't have it pulled up here. So here's a screenshot. Um, and basically all you do is again, in the search box, you just type in whatever you're looking for. It might be something like breastfeeding or, um, uh, or again, you can type in diabetes or whatever it is that you're looking for. And then the guidelines um, come up. And again, most of what they offer here is freely available, but if ever, again, you come into something and you can just read the title and the abstract and you want access to the full text, then you just pop us a message and we'll send you the full text. So where else can you find uh, practice guidelines? The TRIP database, oh, my slides are kind of going out of control on me. Um, it's, so TRIP stands for Turning Research into Practice. And this is a really, really great free resource. And we're gonna take a little, oops. We're gonna take a little jump over to it. So here it is here. And again, I'm going to zoom in so you can see. And this time, um, so again, I'll, I'll search on diabetes. I'll zoom in just a bit more. The thing I like most about TRIP, besides the fact that it's free, 
is um, when you scroll down on the right hand side here. So over on the right hand side, I can see it says it has all the different, um, it breaks the results down by types of evidence. And there's a heading for guidelines, and then there's an entry for Canada. So this is a place that I like to go because it does pull in all of the different kinds of guidelines, and then I can just search through all of these. Now again, um, 349, I'd have to break this down. Um, I could look at diabetes and statins. Let's see here. And so now in Canada, now I'm down to 20 guidelines. Uh, and then it lists them all here. So it's really, really user friendly, really easy to use. So if you knew that there was a guideline or something, or if you were just wanting to know um, if there was a guideline on something, then it's a really great, uh, a really great resource to, to use. Okay, moving along uh, is choose, choosing wisely, which I hope everyone has heard about. Um, so this is the initiative um, that started in the US in 2012, and um, now it's in Canada, the UK, Australia, and other places. Um, and it aims to help clinicians and patients engage in conversation about unnecessary tests and um, tests and treatments and to make smart and effective choices to ensure high quality of care. Um, they've got some great posters and resources and also their site is really easy to use too. So choosing wiselycanada.org and you can just pop in whatever you want. So maybe you're looking for some information about um, diagnostic imaging. Uh, when do you need to use a CT scan? When do you not? They've got some great um, uh, um, like concussion information, um, you know, when do you need to image for these things? There's great ones on opioids. It's really helpful. And I always find, um, I know that, you know, so having launched in 2012, sometimes we, you know, read through the recommendations and we think, oh yeah, that's really good. Always a great idea to check in um, and see what's new and also just to have a refresher of, uh, of what's available, what the recommendations there are. A couple of other notable places to find the guidelines, the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, they have some really high quality information. Towards Optimized Practices in Alberta, and also Google, you can just type in, you know, Canadian Diabetes Guidelines. Uh, I mean, we intentionally list Google at the bottom of the search, um, just because when you're searching guidelines in Google, uh, one, you, you don't know exactly um, where it's going to take you and how authoritative or high quality those recommendations will be. But also sometimes it pulls up some old guidelines as well. So it's hard to kind of filter out the new ones, but it still can be a really great place. And we also should have, of course, included that we are always happy to search for guidelines for you. Okay. Now, up to date, I mentioned this um, sort of in the introduction. This is a really fantastic resource that's available to health professionals all throughout the province. Um, and it has more than uh, 10,000 topics and a drug database, patient education topics, some great graphics and medical calculators, all kinds of things. So we only have two polls left. This one is easier than the others. Uh, okay or I think it's easier than the others. So we're asking here, what level of evidence is found in UpToDate? So is it a clinical practice guideline? Um, is it a broad mix of different kinds of evidence? Is it expert opinion or are you not sure? And I might've lied to you that this one was easier. Okay, so um, I'll close that. Now, the answer is a little bit, it depends on who you ask. So I know that the makers of UpToDate say that it is very, very high quality evidence um, and that the methods behind it is very, very rigorous. Um, some other people are skeptical about 
that level of authority and partially only because they, um, in each up-to-date entry, they include one or two authors and then a couple of editors. And looking at sort of um, to have something be such a high level of evidence usually would require at least three or four um, authors. So a little bit of debate. Um, you know, it's it really is, um, I mean, bottom line, it's a great resource, and especially if it's something that you are you aren't familiar with or haven't, um, you know, you learned about 20 years ago and you haven't had any updates on it, and it's, you know, it is up to date. Um, but it, you know, some would argue it is expert opinion or it's a glorified textbook. Um, some people do treat it like a clinical practice guideline. However, um, treat it like any other kind of evidence and appraise it. If it is uh, the right level of evidence and the right approach for you and the patient um, in front of you or you and the um, situation in front of you, then great, incorporate it. Just, you know, don't rely on it exclusively, as would be our recommendation for um, any, uh, any, any kind of evidence. Okay, um, so lots of people have access to UpToDate. Now, randomized control trials. So we're coming down the evidence pyramid into the unfiltered information. Uh, and this is, so uh, randomized control trials are when participants are assigned by chance to separate groups. And neither the researchers nor the participants can choose which groups. Okay, simple enough. Uh, so when or why would you use one? So to investigate a health intervention. Um, and in, in these cases, then you think about it as one group receives the intervention and one group either, um, and one group then receives the standard level of care. So that might be nothing, that might be the old drug, that might be the regular kind of therapy. Uh, and you have to ensure in the randomized control trials that the groups are um, as similar as they can be at the start. Okay. And I think I also told a fib that we only had two more polls, but we have six in total. This is poll number five. So it's asking, what is a good example of when to use a randomized control trial? So your options are when investigating all of the available research, to analyze research with conflicting recommendations, to compare the current drug to a new drug, and to observe a specific patient group. So I'll let you think through those for a second. And so I'll give you a hint. And this, so this is a randomized controlled trial. So there's always a control group and there's always then the intervention group. Okay. Lots of smart responses here. You were all correct to say that to compare the current drug to a new drug, that would be a perfect example of a randomized control trial or an instance to do a randomized control trial. So uh, they're often, or you know, they're uh, often abbreviated into RCTs and they are the best, most rigorous way of investigating interventional medicine and um, they are unethical, of course, for testing the causes. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> observational. So we moved on from RCTs um, to observational studies. This is when it would have been helpful to have my partner <laughs> to make sure I was steering on course. Okay, so further down um, than the evidence pyramid is the observational study. So randomized control trial is when you can take whatever you're doing and say, okay, we're going to do half one intervention and half are the control, or you might even break it into, into three groups. But basically, for whatever you're doing, you're also controlling for what you're doing. In observational, um, you have to observe. And uh, this is so you're observing individuals or outcomes, but no effort is made to affect the outcome. So an example of an observational study is if you want to study uh, people who have West Nile virus, you can't put or best ways to um, prevent um, uh, uh, contracting West Nile virus. You can't put a bunch of people in a room with West Nile infected mosquitoes 
with half of the people, you know, in mosquito netting and slathered in DEET and the rest of the people, you know, with exposed skin, right? Like that is unethical. So instead you have to just observe uh, the people who did get West Nile virus. And it's not as good as in randomized control trials where you're controlling for all of the factors. Um, but that is what you have to do. And there's actually a fair bit of evidence that says that really good observational studies, uh, really well designed um, observational studies are just as good as randomized control trials. So, I mean, and again, evidence pyramid is a guide and it's not always like one is definitively better than the other. You can probably lump like the randomized control trials and the observational trials together, um, providing that observational trial is the right kind of study design for what you're looking at and the same for the randomized control trial. Okay, uh, one of my favorite slides uh, says here on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And this is then about expert opinion. So there was a time in medicine where you would go to medical school and then um, you know a doctor would practice medicine and if they didn't know the answer to something or they didn't know what to do, then they might pull out their textbook from when they were in medical school or they might um, call a friend or talk to you know, talk to their one friend. And so hopefully we're further along from that now where we are relying more on evidence um, and, and not always just asking experts, but sometimes it's perfectly appropriate to be asking experts. Sometimes it's the fastest thing to do. Sometimes they frankly are the experts who know about things. Um, and particularly if, you know, again, in that situation where we have patient uh, with um, condition A and also B and C, and if all of the evidence is only talking about condition A and says like, but not appropriate for condition B and C, you might need to talk to some experts. Um, oh, I just told you the answer to um, the end of the poll. So we can skip that one. Uh, and uh, so just as we're about to wrap up, we'll come back to that, uh, that kind of diagram. Um, that I showed at the beginning, which is talking about evidence-informed practice in the middle and the best research evidence, the clinical expertise, and then the patient values and, and preferences. So uh, we have the little situation here where our patient, Christine, is very worried about the side effects of taking statins. And so uh, she is a, um, a diabetic, a type 1 diabetic, who is, you know, who just read this article that said that, um, you know, middle-aged people who take statins then um, experience um, a decrease in their cognitive function. And so then you have to, then you have to look at her and say, okay, well, you're a middle-aged person or you're a young person. Should we be putting you on statins if it's looking like you will then have decreased cognitive um, cognitive abilities heading into middle age, uh, but you're also a type 1 diabetic, so we do want to be um, uh, controlling your cholesterol, and these are all different kinds of things that you need to, um, to think about. So another example might be a patient is, you know, has a condition in their knee, and you look at the best available research evidence, and it says, oh, well, commonly when there's this kind of pain, at that place in the knee, and the images all show this, then commonly we do this kind of surgery and then you're good. The patient says, well, but I don't wanna do surgery. I don't wanna go under, um, I don't wanna have the anesthetic or I just am feeling very nervous about it um, and I don't wanna do it. Uh, then you have to take all of those, um, all of those into, into effect. So moral of the story is always, you know, there's not going to be one research paper that completely, completely guides your practice, that there's lots of things that you do want to take into consideration. Uh, and if we were here in person, we'd have a little chat about how you incorporate various levels of evidence into your own work. We'd love to hear, or I would, I keep saying we, um, Christine, I know is here with us um, in spirit, uh, but I'd love to hear about different ways that you do um, use evidence in your work, even if it's just like talking to other people at other facilities, you know, or, or in other provinces that are experiencing, experiencing the same kinds of things as you do. Uh, you know, are there guidelines that you like? Do you use our service and have a little lit search done before you're, you know, updating your policies? 
So if you want to answer um, or give us some examples in the um, in the chat box or the questions box, I'd love to hear them. Otherwise, uh, open for questions and any comments that you might have. So that uh, is sort of the end of our planned presentation for today. And great, somebody is participating. Um, and so somebody says, I, when we ask about how do you incorporate evidence into your practice? I'm just gonna go back to our slide here. Uh, and they say that when they're writing policies, whew, good, <laughs> that's wonderful to hear. And also when um, participating in the work uh, on the community health assessments, I know that they're so evidence focused um, and that they're always working with um, Manitoba Center for Health Policy. So with that raw data, that's so valuable. Um, um, those community health assessments. Thank you for those comments. And I'd love to hear others. Uh, and then just some housekeeping. Um, we, I will post the recording of today's session on the website and uh, I'll be um, sending you the slides from today's session. And I think we've got a little handout as well uh, that kind of summarizes um, levels of evidence. And also we'll do a little survey just to see how I did. And our next session is coming up next month, and it's a really cool one with another guest host. Her name is Grace Roman, and she's going to show us in real time how to take some, um, some uh, GIS data, so data about where people are or where things are, and then how to turn it into a map really quickly. And this could be something that you do from something as, you know, um, you might be mapping people who have contracted West Nile virus and you want just a very visual um, map of where they are or where they have been. Um, it might be mapping out people who have participated in a particular service of yours. Could be anything. So we're going to take that. Um, I'm really excited about that to see uh, how we can just use some free tools and uh, take our data and turn it into maps. Thank you so much for attending today's session. I will be online if you um, want to share ways that you're using your evidence or if you have any questions. Um, and thanks again. Okay, seeing no more questions, I will end the session for today. You are always welcome to contact us afterwards. Thank you so much again for joining us.